Hello viewers, welcome yet again to our ongoing series on Mendelism and beyond. Now, what we learnt in the last lecture was how intergenic interaction could lead to a deviation of the expected ratios of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. And we had read a an example of uh, collaborative genes and the advent of novel phenotypes. We took into account the uh, different comb shapes and uh, in, in case of poultry and of course, the fruit shapes in cucurbita uh, that is the summer squashes. Uh, let us now continue with the idea of epistasis as to what happens if the epistatic gene is recessive and what would happen if it is of the dominant type. But we have lots and lots of information regarding the recessive epistasis. Why? Simply because recessive epistasis is the most common and the most prevalent among the intergenic interactions. Uh, talking of recessive epistasis, it is the recessive gene, say for example, small a, small a homozygous. If it is going to mask the activity of a dominant gene on say another locus where gene B is present, then how would the gene B act, uh, be acting? If the small a, small a is present, it cannot act. When will this gene act, the hypostatic one? Only when we have a combination of the other locus having capital A. So, that means, B can never express itself unless we have small a, small a. Why? Because small a, small a is epistatic to whatever B, the dominant or the recessive. So, this is what is called as recessive epistatic uh, phenomenon. On your screens, if you find that there is for uh, we have taken an example of a recessive gene C and uh, this small c is not going to allow capital A to function at all because small c, small c is a combination which is epistatic to A. What would it mean? It would simply mean that the combinations capital A, capital A, small c, small c and of course, the all small ones will have the sa same phenotype. Why? Because small c, small c is, uh, is uh, epistatic over everyone. So, that means these two become one phenotype. So, only other genotypes, again we see the abbreviated ratios what we learned in the last uh, lecture, capital A dash, capital C dash and small a, small a and C dash are going to just produce two additional phenotypes. So, that means in total we have just three phenotypes now and therefore, the ratio 9, 3, 3, 1 is going to be modified into 9, 3, is to 4. So, this is how uh, we call this recessive epistasis as a supplementary gene. Why do we call it as a supplementary gene? Because the gene by itself has no effect, but quanti uh, qualitatively it has the capability to alter the effect of another gene and uh, therefore, it is also called as a supplementary gene. There are some very interesting examples of recessive epistasis that we are going to discuss. The first one is of course, coat color in mice, which is the most common one. This would be followed by the coat color in Labrador retrievers dogs and we also have an example of a flower color in uh, Collinsia, uh, which is the blue Mary and uh, then finally, a very interesting aspect of the ABO blood groups or the, the, the Bombay phenotype. We have discussed the Bombay phenotype uh, during our discussion on multiple LLs. 
the coat color in mice uh, you have to first understand what are the ingredients and the characteristics of the genes. So, we have to just uh, read them very carefully. We find that the, the, the mice are of different colors. The original color is brown. How do you describe a mouse? A mouse color. So, we, we do not specify it is a brown color. Actually, there is one type of a mouse coat which is called as a gouty, which means in the fur there are patches of black and yellow in the form of bands at the tip. So, this makes this mouse camouflage. So, that means this is controlled by the gene capital A. If you look carefully on your screens, it is designated as A capital A dash. So, that means it could be capital A small a or capital A capital A. It does not matter. At least one capital A should be there. If this capital A is not there, then the mouse coat color would be black. Uh, oh sorry, it would be uh, black because the yellow is not there and uh, absence of yellow would make it black. This also breeds true, but this black is recessive to a gouty. So, two points we have mentioned a gouty capital A, black small a and a gouty dominates over black. Why I am repeating this? Because this would be helpful in our crosses and if the pigment is altogether absent, what would it mean? That means that the small c and small c is present. Obviously, capital A and small a were on the same locus, but then now we are talking about a gene which is on a different locus and this is recessive homozygous. If there is a combination of small c, small c, then the mouse would be white, it would be albino, it would not have any pigment at all. Uh, on your screens, you can see a photograph of how these different mice they look like. That is, they could be black, they could be gouty, and they could be even uh, white ones. Uh, you can also see the normal hair color of a uh, uh, black rodent and a gouty is controlled again as I said by two independent loci and it, the, it is patches or bands of yellow and black which help in better camouflage and of course, the albino one. Now, we find that uh, A and A they are going to control the alleles respectively as far as the coat color is concerned small a for black and capital A as I said and uh, the uh, capital C controls an enzyme which converts this colorless precursor into melanin because darker a mouse coat color more is the melanin. But if capital C is absent then what would happen? This mouse would be an albino. Let us look at this cross uh, very carefully. If we breed a black rodent having a genetic constitution of capital C, capital A, capital A homozygous double dominant and small c, small c and capital A, capital A which is an albino because small c has 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 no capability of, uh, of making melanin. Then we find in the F1 generation all the mice are a gouty. That means, they are a combination of the bands of yellow and dark. And in the next generation, if two agouti are uh, interbred, we find that the ratio now becomes 9 in terms of agouti, 3 in the form of black and 4 in the form of albinos. So, this is the classical 9 is to 3 is to 4 ratio in case of rodents. If we were just to, to summarize uh, again on the basis of the uh, quick method of the abbreviated genotypes you can see on your screen again it is capital A dash capital B if they are present 9 because then uh, both the, the genes are present and below we find that if all of them are small c small c then you have 1 
and there is another combination of small c small c above that whether it is capital A or capital B does not matter then it is a case of of again albino. So, it becomes 9 is to 3 is to 4 which again means in the mechanism that the gene B and the gene A both have to be present in order to have the pigment. If one of them is absent that is the B then you have just the black and if the A is present black remains black and there is no agouti. But if gene B is absent then it has to be an albino because uh, the, the precursor is absent. Let us take another very interesting example of uh, recessive epistasis and that is in the form of different types of uh, uh, the very famous breed of dogs the Labradors. They are also called as retriever Labradors. On your screen you can find a black, a chocolate one and a whitish or a golden uh, retriever as we call it. Golden here means uh, yellowish light yellow or white. Now, uh, let us assume what type of genes or, or, or the names that we can give them. Say for example, we have a locus B which uh, has a gene that is going to be responsible for the production of melanin pigment because this is also a story of melanin which makes a particular uh, dog uh, either dark or light. And so, if there is a dominant LLB now this is the most efficient as compared to the, uh, the small b. And if the capital B is present then the hair of the dog would appear black and uh, if it is small b small b that is homozygous recessive then the hair would appear brownish or chocolate. So far so good as far as the dominance is concerned. But then there is another gene which is present on another locus which is to be designated as capital E let us call it. And we find that the deposition of melanin in the hairs is actually controlled by this gene. If at least one of the functional E LL is present then there is going to be a pigment deposition. Otherwise or it does not matter whether it is black or brown because that will depend on the other alleles. But then whether it has to be deposited or not is going to be decided by E. So, in that case if you have a genotype which involves small e small e it really does not matter whether B is uh, capital or recessive there will be no pigment that would be deposited and the dogs would now appear either white or pale yellow. So, that means in this case small e small e genotype is epistatic to both capital B and small b and therefore, the small e small e if it is present it is going to result in a stoppage of any type of melanin production. So, that means uh, uh, if this is so then the capital B small b um, uh, combination is going to be hypostatic and therefore, again it signifies that it is a case of recessive epistasis. Just to begin the crosses I will give you an abbreviated ratio once again. Now, this black Labrador has to have uh, capital B at least 1 and capital E at least 1 because E was responsible for production of melanin capital E. So, therefore, it is perfectly black, but then if capital E is present which gives the capability to produce the uh, pigment, but then capital B is not there. So, complete uh, melanin will not be produced and this dog would be brownish or chocolate and in case the combination has both the E's of the smaller type as you can see in the third that is the uh, golden retriever or the whitish one obviously then the pigment will be absolutely uh, not absent but but uh, very few of the uh, pigments would be there. So, that means coming to the cross of a black dog that is capital B capital E with a golden one where all the genotypes are recessive it is a double uh, recessive genotype we have now 
the ratio which is as you can see on your screens uh, 9 black, 3 chocolate and 4 golden or white you can call them. So, that means this recessive epistasis on your screens again you can find out with the help of an, a, a hypothetical mechanism that has been proposed. That is both the precursors for melanin which we call as eomelanin if both of them are there in that gene that is the, the, the both the genes were present that is capital E and capital B at least one of them you have the, the coat color as black. If only E is there and capital B is not there then you will have the chocolate ones and if small e small e is there then it really does not matter what the other alleles are it has to be a white or a golden one. We talk of very few examples of, uh, of uh, recessive epistasis in plants when we are teaching this topic. But uh, in fact, the flower color in this blue eyed Mary is also very interesting. Uh, botanically, it is uh, Collinsia parviflora and uh, it is as you can see on your screens a member of uh, Platinogesi. Now, M, N are the, uh, uh, the genes that have been designated along with W. So, capital M, capital M that is in a, in a homozygous or in a heterozygous form leads to the uh, pigmentation blue in the petals and this dominates on another non allelic gene W. So, the W would act only in the absence of M. So, in the absence of M we would find that the combination of W W caps or W W heterozygous would lead to magenta coloration. And the small w small w is epistatic to even m. So, that means when this combination is there then you would have uh, nothing else except white. So, regardless of whether m was present in a homozygous or in a heterozygous form in the presence of small w small w all the flowers would be white. And this is what is designated on your screens now as far as the checkerboard is concerned of uh, cholesnia, you would find that the ratio again is in the form of 9 is to 3 is to uh, 4. So, 9 would be blue, 3 would be uh, magenta and uh, 4 would be white. So, this is again uh, a very interesting example of recessive epistasis in floral color. Finally, let us come to our uh, ABO blood group queries and which is the Bombay phenotype. Please look at the screens very carefully because you can have so many queries and questions to be answered. Uh, are you familiar with all the pedigree analysis and its notations? The one on the left which is square denotes a male and the one on the right is a circle which denotes a female. Now, these are the two parents and uh, two parents the father is A and the mother is AB. Now, they have given rise to three siblings, one AB, the other B understandable, but the one which has been shaded is O. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves, how did a O child come from the parents who are A and AB. How did we fi find this out? This lady or this female child did not respond to anti A or anti B at the time of testing of blood groups. So, it was since it was not responding to anti A and anti B, it was assumed that it is O. But then O genotypically cannot be possible. If you look again, the father seems to be I A I O or I A I A mother definitely is I A I uh, and I B. So, a, a O child genotypically has to be I O I O. So, where is the other I O? We will stop this question here and try to answer it as a result of our uh, 
discussion which ensues. But the point is that this was the actual discovery in the 1950s in uh, Bombay, now Mumbai and therefore it is called as the Bombay phenotype. It is actually a good example of multiple alleles alright, but then also an example of recessive epistasis. Actually genes A and B control the formation of antigens we all know and in this uh, ABO system, but there is another non allelic gene H which controls the production of precursors substance H and it is this uh, H if it is capital it will now make the functional antigen whether it is A or B and if somehow the H is homozygous recessive only very few people are there there will be no agglutination with anti A or anti B or anti AB for that matter. Therefore, apparently persons with blood group naturally they cannot convert the precursor of H into uh, the H antigen and therefore they do not respond to either of the uh, sera that is anti A or anti B and therefore they are designated as, as O. So, this is actually an example of recessive epistasis because persons with small h small h even though their blood group may be a or b or a b they would again behave as the o blood group in a uh, blood test they are called as bombay phenotypes if you can see on your screens the different allelic pairs that have been made you would find at the at the, the, the bottom that uh, no matter whether it is i a or i b uh, if h h is present in a, a in a homozygous recessive state then the abo phenotype would invariably be o in case of a normal o it is h and h but in case of even in the presence of I A and I B, if this situation comes, then again there is no testing. So, genotypically it may be different, but it would behave as a O phenotype. Just to prove this point, if you look at the normal cross of any blood group, you will find that in a cross between two parents having um, A B blood groups, you will have uh, only one fourth having the A blood group one fourth type B blood group and two fourth that is one is to two is to one ratio of the uh, of the uh, phenotypic uh, blood groups. But if you look at the H group, if you have two individuals uh, that is a marriage between a person uh, regardless of whether it is A or B, they, they are, are heterozygous for the H gene. We will find that three fourths of them would have the H substance, they will behave normally as far as the blood group is concerned, but then one fourth will form no H substance and the ones which form no uh, H substance because of being homozygous recessive cannot respond to the antigen A or antigen B in a blood test and they would always show a O phenotype. Here is a summary of all the different blood groups that we have just mentioned with reference to H. So, definitely the small H would have a, would be having a very important role in putting the sugars at the right place on the RBC surfaces and these polysaccharides would decide whether they could respond to anti A, anti B or whether they would not respond at all. So, in this case of recessive epistasis, uh, can we now again come back to the query that we had uh, put to ourselves? Uh, how did this uh, female child come about and what would be the probable genetic uh, constitution? It would be that as you can see the parents are A, the parents are A that means the father is I A I O as I told you in the beginning and as far as the H substance is concerned, he has to have a capital H and small h. The mother AB 
having the uh, the genotype i a i b and she is also heterozygous for h and then in the three progeny the first child the son a b we are not bothered about the genotype here but then the the second daughter is o apparently but genotypically she is i a i o simply because of the fact she has h and h in a recessive state she is not responding to the blood test and therefore she is o and imagine she marries an individual who has the a blood group now her blood group is what her blood group is again b she has a b blood group but she is not responding to the test because she has h h small now when she marries a person with a group they have three children the very fact that the three children are having ab a and b group respectively it means from the the genotypic studies that she is heterozygous for b that is ib and io and her husband is again heterozygous he is i a i o that is why they were able to get a female child who was having an o blood group or a blood group so that means within this gambit you could have different types of situations so we are just trying to prove that how blood groups or the bombay phenotypes are ideal examples for for the uh, recessive epistasis in uh, our next lecture we would like to uh, emphasize upon the double recessive that is duplicate recessive dominant epistasis and the dominant recessive interactions thank you